News got us a new cut content about Rudius' life-changing decision, Turning Point 3, how it went in the novels. Let's see what he has to say. Turning Point 3 wasn't quite the same tone as Turning Points 1 or 2, but it was a significant change to the story just like the others before it. The anime Turning Point, fantastic Turning Point 1 and 2 was like, like an episode, right? It's like mana disaster, shit, everyone gets ported. Orsted shows up, that was some peak. And Turning Point 3 is like, a lot of people meme about what the Turning Point 3 really was. Some people think that it's the opening of the letter. Some people think that it's fucking uh, Norn tripping down the stairs and Rudy making the decision to go out. It depends on what your fucking definition of a Turning Point is. If you define a Turning Point as the events that happen right before meeting the Man God, then it would simply be reading the letter of Geese and then getting into it, right? Again, it's just a definition of semantics. Don't fucking bother arguing with it. Fantastic job capturing the emotion of it all, but there was a bit more to Rudy's indecisiveness. More thoughts regarding whether he should go to Begrit or not, and more emotional turmoil as he came to the final decision for it. Norm pretty much swayed Rudy's decision to not go, and then to basically go. And Nangod is basically saying, Hey, uh, don't uh, go, or you're gonna regret it. Instead, stay here, cheat on Sylphie with one of the furries. So... I don't know, it feels like we should do what the man god is saying, because every time we've done that, we've had pretty decent results. There's always a trade-off of good things and bad things, but for overall, it's better? It, I, I think it's, it's, it's wise to listen to him, even though he has obviously his different sinister um, motives, whatever the man god really wants. Now, uh, we are going to regret this. So maybe in the future, there's going to be a really funny moment or a sad moment that we can meme about and just blame Norn for all the regret that's going to fucking happen. This was preceded by another Day in the Life type chapter, and it's here we get a good old-fashioned calm before the storm scenario. So as we go through that and the missing details from Turning Point 3, hope not going to lie, calm before the storm has been fucking, how many, 19 episodes, bro. It's been, it's been 19 episodes of calm before the storm. I'm just ready for the storm. Hopefully you'll appreciate more yet another amazing episode of Mishoku Tensei. But first. Before we get started, though. My bad. I got, I got the wrong ad lead. Here's the ad coming, though. I'm super excited to announce. Yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. Use your any news con discount from code from ad. Yeah. Anyway, episode 42, turning point three. Covering chapters 6 and 7 from volume 11 of the light novel. With a month having passed since Norn's incident, this would mark the second summer since Rudy arrived here. Holy a shit, change it's been in long. season that often came with a change of outfits since the warmer weather usually let people dress. Is that Nanahoshi? Holy shit. Dress a bit more lightly. Unfortunately, the anime kept everyone dressed the same, but you can find those different outfits in the manga. It's just basically short sleeves, like sure, short sleeve, like like shirts and stuff like that. Julie looking cute as usual. Aisha made outfit. Sylphie, uh, mini short skirt. I don't know. Little good. The weather wasn't the only thing that had changed though, since a certain someone hadn't shown their face in quite a while. Body. Whereas they'd occasionally Gutty. stop by for dinner or watch Rudy train. Ever since that stare down with Richard, Body gone. Gotti hadn't shown up since. It was likely he wandered off and forgot to tell anyone. Did he take this personally that Rudy is associated with Rizier and then Body Gotti decided I'm not going to hang out with you anymore? Or is he just doing his own thing and, and, and Rizier being with Rudy didn't really matter? The encounter with Rizier and, and then we didn't really see Body Gotti, I don't really know what he thinks about Rudy now. It's something the anime doesn't really mention, but in the novel it's a recurring detail since Rudy has been actively looking for Body Gotti. Now, Rudy and Norn studying in the library was actually something that Norn had asked for. She personally made the request to be tutored by him. Okay. Of course, Rudy was ready to teach her everything, but out of worry that he may make Aisha feel left out, he decided to limit Norn's lessons to one hour daily. Well, Aisha doesn't need it, though. So I feel like, well, I, it, it's, it's not about the knowledge. It's, it's about the time being invested. Making it a condensed study session in which the two could review everything her classes covered that day. It was clear Norn was trying her best, but Rudy could tell understanding everything was difficult for her. Yep. Not nearly as much as it was for Eris or Ghislaine, but it would definitely- Really? Not nearly as much as the Eris- no, 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 Ghislaine and Eris, they're actual unga bunga like, brickheads, right? Because, like, <laughs> there was that one time we were trying to learn, like, basic, basic, like, arithmetic, like, elementary school math to figure out, like, how to not get scammed, I think, in, like, a merchant space. I forget. It take quite a bit of effort to get her up to speed with everything. So, 
It was while at one of these study sessions that Nordwood changed the topic to Rijerd. It wasn't rare for them to have casual conversations like this, but most of the time Norn just wanted to talk about him. This would include where he was from and what the demon continent was like. That we should tell Norn uh, the true secret of the spares and the curse of the fucking Laplace and, and the spears and the story of how, you know, Ruizard's spear is actually the spine of his son that he ate or something, right? Then, just like in the anime, the story of the spear, <gasps> okay. they were all things that reminded Rudy of his plan to help Ruizard. The reason why he couldn't before was because a lot of his spare time was occupied heavily by advanced healing and intermediate detoxification classes. Remember, the spells here were akin to trying to memorize an entire book. Something Rudy knew he was getting better at, but only due to the copious amounts of time that he put into Memorizing it. an entire he book, He did consider bruh. spending that time upping his fire and wind magic to the saint level, but spells of that caliber typically required dramatic manipulations of the climate. They weren't really as practical as advanced healing or intermediate detoxification. Because you could literally fuck up the ecosystem by trying to do saint level fire and water. That's actually pretty funny. That's kind of what Megumin does, right, in the Konosuba. She just keeps using explosion and she just naturally changes the landscape and the ecosystem of the environment. Certainly not spells you were going to use on a day-to-day -day basis. That being the case, Rudy figured it was best to focus on something a bit more useful. This included Rijerd's story and the main hiccup with that was how to approach it. Like, he couldn't just do Whoa. a basic good versus evil type Asperts, story since with the, the evil person being Laplace, those in the demon continent probably wouldn't like the story very much. I mean, he was to many considered a legendary hero there. This made approaching the story difficult and opened up the opportunity for Norn to step in. As it turns out, despite her writing being a little bit ch- Oh, I thought this is one Ruizard man, like one punch man, but no, it's our Ruizard man. That's right. Norn's next thing, like what could Norn do, right? We've been thinking about it. I mean, she's not really a fighter and I don't know. What, what is she going to be focusing on? So I think her little project is like a documentary well i'm not sure if it's a documentary style but some kind of like um reading some kind of book some kind of i don't know uh, media that could spread the good words of ruijer and the spirit right childish the recount of ruijer's tales through her provided the punch rudy was missing in his sure it was a little bit rough but the way it read made rudy remember ruijer vividly so much so that he would often tear up in the moments after this meant all Rudy had to do was be Norn's editor, and the book would turn out much better than if he was to do it. How well is this book gonna sell? I wonder. Maybe it's gonna be like fucking crazy best-selling book ever. Now, fast forward to after the shopping trip with Aisha, and the scene with Nanahoshi brings us to something interesting. Not just the six-phase plan she'd laid out for- That's right. Summon an organic object, summon organic, and then, bro, I, I literally say summon an or inorganic object, and I'm like, oh yeah, the plastic water bottle. And of course, there's fucking monkeys in the YouTube comment section saying, <laughs> actually, p plastic is not an inorganic object. I'm like, shut the fuck up. You know what I'm trying to fucking say. Go fucking. For Rudy, but the core division that separates summoning magic into fiend summoning and spirit summoning. These were the two fields in which Fiend summoning magic spirit? was generally divided into, and they both summoned completely different entities. Fiends were intelligent creatures that you had to make a deal with, whereas spirits were artificial entities created out a of mana. A hamster and a cat. So, if we were to focus on fiends first, these were most of the time monsters you'd find out in the wild. Okay. Garden variety creatures you'd have to pay some form of compensation to, after which they'd start to work for you. This wasn't just limited to those types of monsters, though, since fiend summoning also allowed you to summon legendary beasts from other worlds. <laughs> Mewtwo? It could even summon inanimate objects, too. What did you say? Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up, hold up. also allowed you to summon legendary beasts from Mewtwo, after which they'd start to work for you. This wasn't just limited to those types of monsters, though, since fiend summoning also allowed you to summon legendary beasts from other worlds. Such as? It could even other, summon- Other worlds? Hold the fuck up. Other worlds? Like, I mean, I, I know this is a Mewtwo example, but like, not in our world, like legendary monsters from other worlds. Man, couldn't you have like an isekai, like multiverse kind of thing that's going on? Like, what if you just summon like, could you summon like a main character from a different isekai show? A fiend. How about Rimuru? Does Rimuru count as a fiend? He's not really a spirit, is he? I don't know. 
Could you just summon? I don't know how that works. Summon inanimate objects too, which by definition made Nanahoshi's summoning a type of fiend summoning. Naturally, this made Rudy think he could nice. use it to summon Roxy's panties, which probably wasn't the worst application he could come up with for it. <laughs> but anyway, spirit summoning, on the other hand, was more like artificial intelligence. A brand new AI? entity was created out of mana, and the extent to which they could operate needed to be coded into them much like how software needed programming. Okay. This was implemented during the design for the spell itself, so the more complex the spell, the more capable the spirit being summoned. It actually goes to highlight the fundamental difference between spirits and fiends, since while fiends are harder to control and can act on their own, spirits are easy to control but only act on the patterns programmed into them. Almost sounds like spirits are just better than fiends. But then again, it's like you mentioned a legendary monster, which maybe means that the ceiling for fiends is higher than a spirit. How does that work? Of course, the more complex the code, the more complex the spirit, and there was no limit to how far one could take that. Like, Never mind. the authority on summoning- If you can just keep scaling up by making it more complex, then the spirit would then too also be complex. So it sounds like spirit's just better. Nana Easy to control too. in this episode actually had a spirit so complex it could pass for a human. That was just how in-depth this spirit summoning could be taken. What was this scene? Who was this guy in the dark? Actually had a spirit so complex it could pass for a human. Spirit so complex it could pass for a human. Is this even from Mushoku Tensei, this slide right over here? I don't even know what anime this is. That was just how in-depth this spirit summoning could be taken. There was, however, one caveat in the way this magic was perceived, since many believed spirits were beings that lived in the barren world. To them, they were different life forms being forcibly summoned into this world. That would simply make it a variation of fiend summoning, but the discussion of such a topic was never fully investigated to determine if that was true or not. In the anime, it doesn't even fucking tell you the difference between fiend and spirit summoning because I guess it's not that important. So, for now, fiend and spirit summoning were completely different. Okay. Now, a quick addition to the scroll Nanahoshi gave Rudy was that she had actually given him permission to duplicate and sell it. If he wanted to make a template really? then print a bunch of copies, Nanahoshi said he was more than welcome to. Reason being that apparently the guy who made it had more pressing issues to worry about than the leak of a simple summoning scroll like this. Whoa, 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 this is the fucking season one before Mana Disaster, that dude came out in the mask and then fucking lame for a bit, but then before that, was, isn't this Pedogius? Isn't this like a fucking one of the legendary heroes, Pedogius, right? Right right in the floating castle? Nice asset to keep on hand if money got tight, and it would surely net him quite a bit if he did decide to sell it, especially if he mentioned it was from Nanahoshi. This brings us now to Rudy's encounter with Zanaba, and go back, Nanahoshi go back, go back. Rudy was that she had actually given him permission to duplicate and sell it. If he wanted to make a template, then print a bunch of copies, Nenahoshi said he was more than welcome to. Reason being that apparently the guy who made it had more pressing issues to worry about than the leak of- Pedagius made it? This- this thing? Is it- that, that's what it's- I thought you made it. I- What? I thought she fucking drew this shit at the- Sounds like she fucking got it from some- a template? I- I guess you need a base template to work with and- and Pedogase is the one that made a template and he just doesn't give a fuck because he got other shit to do. I, I, am I understanding this correctly? The guy who made it had more pressing issues to worry about than the leak of a simple summoning scroll like this. So this was a nice asset to keep on hand if money got tight and- it like, why, why did Anini specifically show an, as a scene of Pedogase there? Like, it's not just someone else, it's specifically that person. So he's the one that made- uh, that, that made it? I- I don't fucking know net him quite a bit if he did decide to sell it, especially if he mentioned it was from Nanahoshi. This brings us now to Rudy's encounter with Zanaba, and the only thing to note from- And not a single person in chat has any fucking clue of what I'm even saying, but I don't blame you. Most of you are probably fucking lurkers on a fucking phone that don't even read Mushoku Tensei light novel. You're probably just as confused as me, but if there's a single fucking light novel reader that understands what's going on, I fucking hate you. Here was the interesting dynamic between him and Ginger. A couple chapters back, there was that whole incident where Zanaba was strangling her, but abuse like that didn't seem to bother her at all. In fact, despite their arrangement being that of a master and servant, to Rudy it seemed much more like a weird commuter marriage. I agree, the way that Ginger gets treated is kind of fucking weird, and she got like abandoned, she just banged, it's this pure fucking Stockholm Syndrome, right? That or the bond between a cult leader and their most faithful disciple. Yeah, pretty Either much. Way, what stuck out to Rudy was Ginger's approach to all this. 
she often kept herself out of view and only approached when needed, and despite there being a bodyguard room right next to Xanaba's, Ginger instead chose to sleep in an apartment down the street from him. <laughs> Is it better? She believed it was too presumptuous to reside next door to a prince like him. She really worshipped. Like, like, brainwashed. I mean, who might have judged the culture back then? But like, holy fuck, it's, it sounds like Ginger is just, uh, just a brainless person that only exists to serve the Zanobo family and no matter how, how they get treated, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. My life for Zanobo. This is why Rudy asked the question that he did and it made him think perhaps Ginger was some kind of masochist. Maybe? Switching over to Cliff now. The we, do we have the answer? Why, why did you even... Why? Why did you pledge your fealty to Zanobob? Was there a fucking answer that was like reasonable? I can't remember. Perhaps Ginger was some kind of masochist. Switching over to Cliff now, the contraption he built was more so described to be a sumo-sized loincloth. Or a chastity belt. Irina Rizle saw a chastity belt and then dumped, dumped Cliff and said, fuck off, I'm gone. Well, there goes that relationship. To further clarify the way it works, it essentially forces external mana in to counteract the internal mana within Alina Lise. The external mana is aligned with the frequency of the curses, and that in turn allows the two opposing flows to neutralize each other. Sure, but did it have to look like a fucking a chastity belt? Like, could you not have made a necklace, a ring, any type of accessory, different contraption? It just had to look like that. A chastity belt, huh? Kind of like the way that noise cancelling works. A frequency gets cancelled out by the presence of one that's the direct opposite to it. Cliff's design was only just a prototype, but for some reason, Alina Lise insisted that it was good enough. To her, she didn't care how it looked, but to Cliff, he couldn't bear to have her even wear it. <laughs> that's, that's fucking ridiculous. Imagine wearing this thing around. It's like a fucking, it's like a battle armor, bro. It was a point of conflict in which the two had actually gotten into a fight over. And then, dumped. It's over. Cliff made a chastity belt. Edina Dese said, and I mean, honestly, Edina Dese is the one that said, I'm fine with it. And then Cliff said, no. And then, I don't know. I'm, I'm just memeing. I'm, I think it's just funny that as soon as this is brought up, the relationship would seem to be so fucking strong. Done. That's what led to his plan to miniaturize it. And the rest was pretty much as we saw. One last thing to note from this scene here, though, was that the device did absolutely nothing to make Alina Lise less horny. What is the fucking point then? So, even with the loincloth working the way it was supposed to, Alina Lise was still, well, Alina Lise. <laughs> That's. That, that, what, what is the point of the contraption if it's still making her horny? The entire point is to try to fix her curse, but the curse makes her super horny. And you're supposed to shut that down and. Whatever. Whatever. This brings us now to turning point three, and the news of Rudy's child came a lot faster than he expected. Given how everyone was saying how elves had a hard time getting pregnant, he was surprised to hear that it had happened so fast. Me too. It was when he put his hand onto her stomach that the faintest bump could be felt coming from inside of it. It was a physical indication of what Rudy and Sylvie created together, and it was that realization that caused all sorts of emotions to arise in him. I fully expect this child to die. Honestly, like, I don't think that's too crazy of a guess, right? We've been having too many happy times and a turning point is happening. And a part of me jumped the fucking gun and said, if, if it's like, if we, if we abandoned Sylphie and just went to say Paul and then Zenith and stuff like that, the regret was like, the child would be left alone to like, what's it called? It wouldn't grow up with the father, right? So that's like the bad thing. But I was thinking like, shit, the child's just going to fucking die. I don't know how. If we ex accidentally brought like Sylphie with us to beg her, like pregnant, that's not going to happen, right? Sylphie's staying here. But like, I could definitely see a future where the kid's going to die. And I, I could totally see it. He knew what he was feeling was happiness, but to describe it only as such felt kind of inadequate. He couldn't put into words just how happy he was, but it was clear from his confusion that this emotion went far beyond that. 
Like, don't you think it's the perfect time when Rudy is, like, at his peak happiness to just entirely put, just fucking collapse this castle of cards? Like, the card of, like, what's it called? The house of cards, right? You're, you're building up, you're stacking up. He's so happy. He's so happy. Everything is just fucking perfect. Knock fucking everything out. How, what is the most shocking thing that could happen? Either Sophie dies or the baby dies. Both die. I don't fucking know. Rudy would then get a bit frisky, even more so. Fuck it. Let Zenith die. Let Paul die. Let everyone fucking die. Let, let Rudy be fucking alone. And then who shows up? Eris. Because, like, before, Eris left, and then Sylphie saves Rudy, but then it'd be, like, poetic on, like, who saves him now when everything goes to shit? Eris. It'd be, like, a little circle. It's like a circle of life. I don't know how that would work. So then what we saw, and Aisha would say a few sus things further indicate. Brother dear, we need to be gentle with the lady of the house for a while. You're going to need to refrain from... Intercourse for the moment, right? Of course. Aisha smiled and lifted the hem of her skirt slightly upward. If you're... If you're desperate, I'm always available to pick up the slack. What the fuck, Aisha? What are you talking about? What in the fuck, little sister? That's why Pedo Sensei, sorry, Pedo Pedo Tensei gets a very bad, bad look. Uh, oh boy, oh boy. Indicating her interest in Rudy, she would then proceed with her duties as the maid and go inform Princess Ariel of these new developments. This brings forth the cutscene in which Rudy and Sylphie are alone, and it's here where they have more of a heart to heart about everything. Once again, Rudy couldn't find the right words to say, but the message he wanted to express was that he'll be there to help her. Raising this child wasn't something. <laughs> No, you won't. He gonna be a classic anime dad. Zanima said it the best. A child will grow up even without the presence of a dad or some shit, right? Fucking go for a pack of smokes. Go, go get a fucking, go, 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 go get, go to the fucking gas station to go get some milk and then you don't come back for the next fucking 20 years. Something he wanted Sylphie to think she'd have to do on her own. So the only thing he wanted to say was how he was going to take responsibility. No, you're not. Sylphie then asked whether he wanted a boy or a girl. And as it Can was even now, decide? that didn't really matter to him. So long as the kid was healthy and happy, Rudy felt he'd be satisfied no matter what. I don't know. I, I just, I just. We're going to regret it if we go to the fucking demon continent. So, like, here's maybe what I'm thinking. Man God is usually just always right, right? He's just a god. He just seems to have, like, prescience. Just knows, right? And he's saying that even if we go, you're gonna... If, if we go, you're gonna have regrets. If we don't go, we don't have regrets. What does that mean? That means that whether or not Rudy goes or not, what happens in Begarit is not gonna change the outcome. We're trying to save Zenith. Maybe that's just doomed from the fucking beginning. Well, I don't know. I don't know, maybe Rudy going there is going to cause more deaths in, you know, trying to save Zenith or not. But, like, I wonder if the regret thing is simply a matter of, even if Rudy goes, nothing will change in the outcome of what happens in Begarit, and then the kid will grow up without a father, and you will regret it. You will regret by going to something that you could have never changed while abandoning your child. Is that the regret? Or, maybe, if he went, something worse is going to happen in Begarit Continent compared to an example where he stayed. I don't know, maybe it's one of the- it has to be, logically, it's one of the two, right? Sylphie would then express how she truly felt like Rudy's wife now, and it was then that Rudy realized just how anxious she probably was. I just realized, too, the time it takes to go one year, right? If, 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 if we go, it's gonna take one year. We have how many episodes left of Mushoku Tensei? Uh, I, I think we're like five, like, uh, what? what Six or seven, six or seven episodes left or some shit? Hold up, do we, do we have enough time to cover one year? They're gonna have a time skip, right? Surely they're gonna have a time skip. Or I swear to God, if, if the next six episodes is like... It, it, you can't... Uh, the, the opening spoils shit. Like, the, the, the one year travel has to be expedited. There's, there's no shot they're gonna fucking cuck us with the remaining six episodes and be like, yeah, season three is gonna be when we actually get to beg at it. And the six years is, the six episodes is gonna cover the fucking, the adventure to the continent. Oh, I don't know anymore. It's about everything. I mean, since she was always saying how difficult getting pregnant was for her, she was likely feeling inadequate at the thought of not being able to produce a kid for him. Now that such a burden was lifted, though, Sylphie could rest easy knowing that she could provide for Rudy. It did suck that he would have to put up with a dry spell, but in his own words, he said he'd live. In fact, 
If he ever went and slept with another woman, then Rudy told Silphy she could kick him out of the house for good. <laughs> so if I cheat on you, when you come back, you can kick them. <laughs> oh, we kick him. Oh, we kick Rudy out. Okay, not not the girl. Okay, I thought it meant that like Rudy's bringing a girl back. Okay, Sylvie assured him that even if he did, she wouldn't be angry. But she did say how she'd be sad. She'd Don't understand do why he went and did it. But what? I mean, Paul. Paul, like, it's got Paul's genetics. Like, bro is definitely gonna fuck shit up, bro. One hundred percent, he's gonna cheat. What if Eddie Narizze jumps on her? Jumps on him. Eddie Narizze is no longer bound by Cliff, and we're fucking traveling. I swear to God, if next episode we immediately cheat and both sides fucking, and it's not even like we're cheating with our our wives' great grandmother, how, how does that make sense? But still feel dejected knowing it happened. It was okay. a relatively mild reaction given the topic they were talking about. Of course, Rudy had no plans to betray her at all because if Sylvie went out and did the same thing to him, then he couldn't even imagine how awful it'd feel. Yeah. And I bet Sylphie would never cheat, but I could totally see a Rudy doing something like that or being overcome by desires after Irina Rize pounces on him. Now, it was later that evening that Aisha would return, and along with her came the congratulations from everyone she'd talked to. Xenobus said he'd visit in five days, Ariel a bit later in ten, then along with her Cliff and Alina Lise. Linnea and Persena said they'd visit whenever was convenient, and Nanahoshi simply said congrats. These were the messages from Rudy's Congrats. friends here, minus Spotty Gotti since he was still missing. Where is now, he? Normally Aisha would have taken this opportunity to flex on Norn, but instead she simply smirked with a look of pride. It wasn't exactly the non-competitive behavior Rudy was hoping for, but it was a good start considering that little things smirk. weren't quite as verbal anymore. That's not to say the two still didn't fight, but for now they weren't saying anything truly cruel to each other. It would just be a while before that lingering conflict between them was fully dissipated. I wanted to Fast fight more. to two months after this, and that's when Rudy would receive word of Zenith's letter from unsuccessful Geese. rescue. The letter was sent via express mail, but even that couldn't help it from taking six months to arrive here. S six months? So, like, 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 think about that. How does that work? So, something shitty happened when trying to save Zenith, and it says, this is hard, send help. And at that point, it took six months for that letter to come here. So what's been happening throughout those six months? Have they just stopped entirely? Like so many things could have happened. And then imagine the one year that takes to fucking get there. A year and a half of us not knowing what happened after this shit went down. That is, uh oh. It was immediately after that Rudy's world would flash white right before his eyes. And the next thing he knew, he was talking to the man god again. And again, if you define a turning point as the events that happened right before me and the man god, then it would be simply reading the letter, would it not? A lot of people have a lot of different definitions on what a turning point is, but again, if you go with an event that happens right before me in the manga, I think it makes sense that it's Geese's letter. It's the realization of, oh shit, we need to fucking make a choice of whether or not we have to go or not. So, to be transformed back into the person he hated so much instantly filled him with anger and resentment. It's the reason he was so hostile right from the get-go. He's always... Back to old Rudy form, IRL Rudy, right? Whenever he's meeting Mango. That's something I've noticed. The rest was pretty much word for word from the novels, then Rudy would find himself laying in bed. He couldn't remember how it was he had got there, so he could only assume that it was the shock that had gotten to him. Since the last thing he remembered was staring at the letter, that was the first thing that came to his head now. He recounted the alarming nature of such a message, then waited again. <laughs> the manga literally says, A turning point! From those happy days, thank fucking god, I'm tired of these fucking happy days. And the classic, on break next month. That's fucked up. This is a monthly release manga. Bro, I could not, when I used to read manga back in the day before doing anime reactions, bro, a week break was like, fuck me. A one month break? Kill me, dude. Kill me. Against that of what the man god had told him. This brought forth all the risks that came with traveling to Begarit, and the first was the possibility things were resolved by now. The second was the minimum year of travel it would take to get Imagine? back, and the third was the- Imagine if we were able to master teleportation during the entire time we were at the academy, and we were able to just like, just teleport to the Begarit. Man, that would be amazing, huh? But like, obviously that's fucking OP, and if we had those kind of abilities, then things would be much more easier, but like, damn. If we could just teleport right there and back, Oh, that's, that's just too much though. The possibility that he could die on this journey. 
They were all risks big enough to make him choose not to go right now. Three days would pass without Rudy changing his mind, and the more he saw Aisha, Sylphie, and Norn, the more their looks of anxiety became apparent. This only made Rudy more uncertain in his decision, and it made him desperate for advice from the likes of Alina Lise and Zanaba. So, Alina Lise would mention how she would be abandoning her- Yeah, Alina Lise was like, yeah, I'm down, I'm down. Let's abandon my boyfriend, I'm down, let's go, what other decision I have? And Zanaba said, fuck your child, Rudy, they can grow up without a dad, let's fucking go. Her post with Ariel, mostly because there was actually very well, Zanaba's not going right. danger for her here. The whole thing was just a goodwill gesture on her part anyway, so her leaving wasn't something the princess could even object to. As for her breakup with Cliff, <laughs> this was something Rudy knew would affect him significantly. This is fucked up. Since most members of Millis stayed loyal to one person their entire life, Dark Alina Cliff Lise incoming. just suddenly leaving could very well shake the foundations of his entire fate. Like, I thought this relationship was actually genuine and strong. I thought that Aina Rize and Cliff, they were able to see beyond their differences, and I thought this is true love. And then within a span of one episode, Cliff shows up with the fucking chastity belt that Aina Rize says, fuck you, I'm gone. She didn't really say that, but like, damn, she just dropped in like that. What? Like, could you, could you, and then it's like, okay, you could just tell Cliff that I'll, you know, I, I'm going to be gone for a bit. You don't have to break it up. And then, and then she said like, hey, Cliff is a young kid. This is like puppy love. He, he doesn't know any better. I'm leaving. I don't know how to really feel about that. It's like. The fuck? What, what the fuck? You just baited me with this shit. There was no telling what a blow like that would do to him, especially for someone as devout as him. Dark Cliff incoming. Fuck the Pope, he joins the dark side. He returns to being a fucking chuny, edgy kid. Would that be fun? I don't know, I feel bad for Cliff. Alina Lise was so firm in the way she spoke though that Rudy knew he wouldn't be able to convince her otherwise. It also didn't help that she thought part of this was her fault either. Since she was the one who told Rudy to stay here initially, she couldn't help but feel that some of this mess was her responsibility. Switching over to Zanaba now, his whole conversation just confirmed that he was a real one. There's nothing to add other than- He was a real one? Yeah, abandon your kid, yeah, yeah. Or being a real one is when you abandon your child, confirmed by any news. That's so, that brings us now to Rudy's turning point. No, that's a, that's a very blank statement and disrespectful to Mr. Andy News, who always gives us good content like this. Him, him saying that he's a real one means that, you know, Zanaba was always there down to support Rudy for his cause. And yes, he did say, fuck that kid. He can grow up without a dad. But besides that, I think it's about like him giving Rudy assurance to be like, yeah, you know what? You should go. The night before, he'd spent contemplating whether he should go or not. And for every reason he found making it seem like he should go, he just found another convincing him not to. It was a constant tug of war between betrayal and responsibility. It was Norn's act the day after that helped him to finally make up the his true mind turning since point. it made him realize exactly the type of luxury he was dealing with. You see, unlike Norn who didn't get to weigh her options of staying versus going, Rudy actually could. Though he didn't realize it at the time, just having the option to choose was a luxury that no one else could afford right now. I mean, it's not like Norn could just get up and travel to the Beggarid <laughs> continent, she ain't gonna fucking make fuck. She's not gonna survive a week traveling. But I do appreciate that she packed up and she showed her resolve. She's like, you know what? You're not gonna go. I'm gonna fucking go and save mom myself. I I can respect that. Because it wasn't something she knew how to do. Rudy, on the other hand, could make the journey, save his parents, and come back safely. Yet, could is he actually gonna do it? This man, God said we're gonna regret it if we go. I mean, mm. I, well, it, it is a turning point, right? So I, I'm i expecting character death to happen. Here he was choosing not to. It was something that Norn didn't even have to fall to. <laughs> yeah, but she did fall. <laughs> I love it when children fall down and start crying. I'm an evil, evil man that just love bullying kids. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Make him realize. All she had to do was ask why with all his power and experience he wasn't doing anything and that was enough to make him understand. This scene was actually so good because I didn't even realize it myself because from Norn's perspective, it's like you're Rudeus. You can do fucking anything. You're like a god. Why you're not going to go save mom and dad? But Norn doesn't understand the, 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 what Man God said. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Man God specifically said, if you go... You will regret it. So you should stay 
and I ad I advise you to go fuck, you know, Linea Persona, have a kid, and just chill here, or you're gonna regret it. That's, I'm pretty sure that's what Mangas said, and that's why Rudy was like, shit, well, I need to see my parents, but you're telling me that I'm gonna regret it. What the fuck am I gonna do? Then he decided to stay out of hesitation. And then Nor in Norn's perspective, it must be so crazy, right? Because Norn is like, what the fuck? This is our parents. You could do anything you wanted to do. Why are you not going? That was like a shot. That was like a rebel. That was, that was like a big moment of realization from Norn's perspective. Like, yeah, that, that is kind of crazy. huh? That's how other people must be seeing um, Rudy ha hesitate to make his choice. Up to make him understand. There were people who could take care of Silphy while he was gone, but he was the only one who could save his parents. It's the reason why Geese wrote the letter to him and no one else. This would lead to Rudy's life-changing decision, and it marks the end of what was his once peaceful home and school life. Finally! So, that's turning point three as it- And you know what sucks? And maybe convenient on, on why Bodyguardy hasn't shown up recently? Wouldn't it be nice if Bodyguardy like traveled with us to Begari and like did all that shit together? I'd be so much more confident and happy and secure if a demon fucking king was with us, but unfortunately he's not. And... Could... Ruijer have not come with us to help? Where did Ruijer go? Ruijer went off to do his own good deeds and selling figure. What? Could have Ruijer not have come with? The Wait, I'm. I don't know how to. What the fuck? He, because like he dropped the kids off and he's like, I'm gone. I, I obviously he didn't have expectations that Rudy would then travel to beg on it and save. But like, I. I, 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 yeah, he, he is trying to find other spares to repopulate, right? But I, I guess he's got his own different things to do. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of other potential characters that we know that could be traveling with us. Bodyguard comes to mind. Rujud and Bodyguard are traveling together. That would never fucking happen, right? That'd be interesting. They'd be very tense. I, I, I don't know about that. So right now, it's only Erin Arize, right? Who else is really coming with Rudy? It's just Rudy, Erin Arize. Sophie's staying. No other students here are coming with us. That's it, right? It was in the novels, and as I'm sure you could tell, they did quite a good job bringing it to life. I'm sure some of you were expecting something as crazy as Turning Points 1 and I 2, was. but not all Turning Points have to be super dramatic. Well, the significance of a Turning Point is like how dramatic it is, as Andy and you said, right? The Mana Disaster and the Scattering, or like... Orsted showing up. It's like, it happens in the span of an episode, but I feel like this turning point is different. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about the definition of a turning point, but I feel like this overall arc in saving the dad is like a turning point. Like the disastrous shit that's about to happen is basically gonna be the journey to, you know, fucking do big at it and then whatever fucked up shit that happens there. I, I know that the turning point is basically like Sylphie getting pregnant and opening the letter, but could you not also interpret this as like, this turning point is like a long lasting one where it's pretty much the next arc of like saving mom and dad. That's what's gonna be like the turning point three. I don't know, maybe it's a stretch. There's simply points in the story where a decisive change is made, which in this case is Rudy leaving Sylphie and going to beggar it. Yep. But yeah. That's pretty much all I got to say for this, so I hope you enjoyed this video on- I did. Thank you, Mr. Annie News, guys. Go to his channel. Like his videos. Sub to his channel. He always gives such great content about the stuff that we missed to being only anime only. And finally, Turning Point 3 is here. We have been begging. We have been begging. And everybody's kind of pretty sick and tired of the school arc. I personally found a- I enjoyed the school arc for a bit. It was refreshing, right? And it was also kind of funny. It felt like um, it, the whole season one, season two part, part one was dedicated towards, you know, fixing his dick and then meeting with Sylphie. And then part two, you know, the, the, up until now has been, you know, more marriage stuff, post-marriage, having a baby, other fun stuff. But I think a lot of people have been waiting for a long time of, you know, adventurer Rudy coming back. And... Maybe like a monkey's paw. Maybe the things that we wish for is not going to come in the way that we expect. Because as the man God said, if we go there, we're going to fucking regret it. What's going to happen? I already gave him my take. I think there's two options. If he's saying that we're going to regret it, that means that even if we went there, the outcome of what happens to our parents won't change or something worse might happen. It's got to be something like that. And I cannot wait for the depression that's about to hit.